I've preached on this topic before. I know I'm, I'm going over some old sermons, but you know, obviously I've preached on a lot of things over the years, and some of it you guys won't remember, and some of it you, weren't, uh, you wouldn't have even been here. Maybe you weren't there for the time I preached it, so I'm just preaching through some of the things that are sort of on my mind right now. Right now, I've been thinking a lot about, because you know, my, my oldest son is going through year one, um, just doing a lot of homeschooling, and my wife is. Uh, so I've just been thinking of ways, you know, to, 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 to make us, you know, how we can be more effective, make it easier for parents to teach their children the Bible, you know, teach them, you know, just concepts, things like that. And, and one thing that really frustrates me is, you know, there's not really much out there that is biblically accurate, first of all. And even if it is biblically accurate, some of it, it's, it's usually not the King James Bible. You know? So one thing I've been working on, I know it's kind of random, I remember Kevin, <laughs> Kevin called me uh, about uh, the whole issue that um, happened online recently. If you don't know what it is, then I'll tell you about it at dinner. But, um, so he called me about it, and, and then I was, I was saying, oh, I forgot that he was calling me that night because I, wor- I was working on something. And basically, I was just working on some writing sheets for kids. Uh, Anthony and I were talking about it too, just different workbooks and whatnot. So I, I, I downloaded like the font that, you, you, that children use in workbooks where it's like dotted and it tells them where to start from and everything like that. And I just made my own worksheets, right? I made some practice worksheets for Simon and the kids. Uh, but, you know, I put a King James verse on there. So I had A and then I had I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Just things like that. I just thought it's, it's cool if we can work the Bible into, you know, when they do their writing and whatnot. And a lot of Christian organizations do that But generally, it's not King James, and it's watered down and things like that. So some other things I've been doing as well, I created some sort of coloring in Bible verses where they're just sort of uh, uh, like the Bible verse is uh, like clear, if that makes sense, like outlined, and then they can color it in. And then we've been sticking that up in our house as well. So we can stick the Bible up around the house, and it's like colored in by our kids and whatnot. So I'm just thinking, I've just been thinking of things like that. So all that to say this, the reason why I'm preaching on this sermon tonight is just because that's been on my mind, just teaching children the Bible. But um, the title of the sermon tonight is, is just The Lie of Age Appropriateness. The Lie of Age Appropriateness. And, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, you know, the Bible is for all ages, isn't it? Like a lot of people think, that a lot of people have this concept that there are things that are suitable for adults, that are okay for adults, but they're not okay for children, like certain topics. And obviously, you know, when you, the, the, word age, the word age appropriateness can refer to, or, you know, you're going to make something a little bit simpler for a child because they may not understand necessarily the complexities of things that, you know, may be deep and complex. But what I mean by the word age appropriate, it's this false idea that there are topics that are okay for adults, but not for children, right? Because even though you may talk about something to a a greater degree of complexity with an adult than with a child, the topic is not inappropriate. Like if it's something that's appropriate for an adult, then it's appropriate for a child. Um, And we see this sort of in our culture, don't we? We see like the film ratings where we see like, oh, you know, G and PG, like guardian and parent going. Like that's okay for kids as long as they've got a parent watching it with them, but M, it's just this, this arbitrary age. Well, at least as long as you're 15 and over, now you can watch, you know, this sex scene on TV. And if the sex scene actually shows you some reproductive organs, that's MA plus or that's R. And as long as you, you know, that's, that's not okay if you're a child. You know, that's not okay if you're under 15. But if you're over 18, then it's okay for you to look at it. And then you have R, which is 21 or whatever. I don't know all the different. Yeah, but it's just this idea. It's, it's in our culture, isn't it, in, in terms of the film ratings. Now, this is where you get this, you know, this stereotypical situation of kids asking parents awkward questions, right? Because, you know, sometimes you'll, they'll ask their, their parent a question, maybe about, you know, the relationship between a husband and wife, you know, just things that we as a culture think are not appropriate for children. And then, you know, they get that stereotypical situation of the parents are kind of awkward, like, oh, you know, where did you, who, who told you that? Did Johnny at school tell you about that? You shouldn't know about these things. And why are you asking that sort of thing? You know, this is where it comes from, this culture that people believe that children shouldn't be told about certain things and that they're too young for it. Um, And this is also the reason why children's Bible studies 
in a lot of churches are so watered down. It doesn't tell them the whole story. It doesn't give them all the details. Why? Because they're too young for it, right? They're just it's arbitrary. Like it's, they're not, it's not appropriate for children to be learning these things. Um, you know, parents avoid teaching on these subjects. Preachers avoid preaching on it. You know, you don't hear a lot of preaching on it. Why? Because it's not age appropriate. It's not for children. So you don't hear about it in the sermons where everybody's there and all the young people are there. You only hear about it where the children are not and children grow up. You know, maybe it's too late for them to learn about these things. So a couple of, you know, children are naturally curious. You know, if you have children of your own, obviously children are going to ask questions. They always ask why this, why that. And generally, if you give them an answer, it satisfies it. But if you don't, this, that curiosity is going to stay there. Right? And if you don't answer their questions, if you avoid their questions, I believe it will only reinforce in their mind that, that you're not a source of information. Right? Because every time they ask you, you either don't know, you don't want to tell them, so then they'll find out somewhere else. And the person that does give them answers, they'll start to build the relationship with them, and that's where they'll seek their other answers, and who knows what else they'll learn from them, you know, other philosophies and not what, what not. So, yeah, detailed information might not be effective with children you know, like I said, due to the complexity and their ability to comprehend, but that doesn't mean, uh, meant, mean the subject matter is inappropriate, right? So this is what I want to just sort of reinforce today, just this idea that, you know, there are certain topics that children shouldn't be exposed to or shouldn't be taught, but they are, they are only appropriate for adults. Um, so let's look at this. So this concept it's not biblical at all. This idea of age, what's, what's age appropriate? Meaning like, you know, it's okay for an adult to be talking about it and watching it and all that sort of thing, but it's not okay for, uh, for a child. Now, in 1 John 3, 4, the Bible says, whosoever, so that's anybody, right? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So it doesn't matter how old you are, right? Sin is sin. You know, if you're young, it's sin. If you're old and it's wrong, it's sin. And if it's right for an adult, then it's okay for a child, right? There's not this idea that if you just go over a certain age bracket, that all of a sudden something that is sinful is okay for you. Um, and likewise, the other way. It's not like it's sinful for you when you're young and then you hit all of a sudden an age bracket and then all of a sudden it's not sinful. So if it's wrong for adults, it's wrong for children. But if it's right for adults, it's right for children as well, right? So... This is what I believe the Bible teaches. Now, 1 Timothy 6.3, it says here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Um, and in Proverbs 35, it says here, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So the Bible says here that the words of the Bible are wholesome words. Right? Every, God, every word of God is pure. There's nothing wrong with the word of God. It's not like there are parts of the word of God that aren't appropriate for children and there are parts of the word of God that are appropriate for children and we need to censor these things. Now, one, the advantages, right, of you bringing up what I guess our culture and what the world would consider not age appropriate is that you get to, if you are the one to proactively expose them to these topics, like, you know, just, if you, there's not really that many topics, right? I guess it's like the topics of, like, sex and the topics of parenting or um, just, just things that generally, you know, children aren't exposed to, you know, judgment, things like that, uh, you know, like maybe gore and things like that, right? Uh, and, and uh, you know, things that are described in the Bible. Um, so there's not really that many things. But see, if you're the one to proactively expose them to that and teach it to them, then you can control what their first impressions are, right? You can control how they should think of it, right? Because you're the one to reveal it to them. You're the one to expose it to them. And when you talk to them about it, then you can explain also the right way to see these things. So, you know, this is another reason why we have preaching in church and everyone's gathered here right because it's not like there are parts of the bible that children shouldn't be learning and parts of the bible they should be learning and likewise so it's not like we have to say all right kids all the kids have to go out somewhere and learn about some watered down bible story somewhere while we actually talk about the details of the bible actually go through the scripture no no the scripture is good for adults and children and that's why it's fine for children to be here no matter what we are talking about as long as we are talking about the bible you know and we're talking about it in the right way 
it's good for adults, it'll be good for the children as well. Yes, I understand that they may not pick up everything, right? But that doesn't mean they don't learn anything at all. And, you know, it, it just surprises me sometimes the things that my kids do pick up, right? That they, that they are listening. And sometimes Simon will repeat things to me of things that I've taught. So it shows that, you know, even though right now, you know, he's got his hands in his, in his face, and, you know, he might not, but he's hearing things, right? He's listening to things. He's seeing how we do things. Uh, I, I, I feel... Uh, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, he, he's very good at reading is because he hears the Bible read in church. So when he's reading the Bible, it's not foreign to him. He knows what the Bible sounds like. He can read it. And he's actually doing really well. It's just all of a sudden, I don't know, it's just like this year, he's just like gone, Ooh, where he's learned how to read. And now he's just like, he's just reading through chapters of the Bible. Like he doesn't, he doesn't understand everything. He doesn't read every single word, but he's, he's just trying to read through it. It's not like it's, you know, he's just saying, oh, it's too hard and doesn't try it. So this is why everyone's here. This is why we don't separate off into, you know, the Sunday school and separate the kids off because we want the kids to be here listening to Bible preaching, listening to the Bible being taught. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with children ga children's games. Like I was saying, I was thinking about ways to make it more easy, uh, easier for parents to teach their children. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have a problem necessarily with the games of a lot of Sunday schools and children's activities and Awana and whatnot. The problem is, is it's, usually, and it's usually substituted for church, right? Where children are actually taken away during church, during the preaching, and then they never really experience church until they're like 10 years old, like after they get out of the Sunday school, and then they start experiencing church. And then you wonder why they, they can't sit through it, they think it's boring, they, they're not, they don't know how to pay attention. It's because they've been taught for 10 years or 11 years that, that it always has to be fun, it always has to be you know, exciting and colourful and whatnot, rather than just listening to somebody explain something and learning something deep. Let's look at the example of Jesus. In Mark 9, 36, it says here, And he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whatsoever, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. So this is a time when Jesus is preaching, right? And there are actually children present. It's not that children aren't there. I mean, he's there. He took a child and set him in the midst. A child has to obviously be there to be set in the midst. But not even that. He's, I mean, he's taking this child up into his arms, right? So, you know, if, if, if it's not just children that are Michael Jr.'s age, right? Because it's not, Michael Jr. is not the sort of age where you take that child into your arms, right? It's usually young children like Sarah or Abel. You know, I, I wouldn't even really take Simon into my arms and he's six years old i mean at that age they 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 don't really want to be held anymore it's probably a bit embar embarrassing for them but a child that's like sarah's age or abel's age i mean they're the ones that are in the midst and he says he's taking him up in his arms so these are very young children that are in the midst of jesus when he's preaching here and john answered him saying master we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he followeth not us and we forbade him because he followeth not us so i mean they're talking about casting out devils in the midst of children, like a lot of people think like, oh, that's like, scary, like, children shouldn't be hearing these things. No, no, I mean, they're talking openly about, you know, devils being cast out and devils and, you know, the children are there, they're listening, they're seeing this conversation. Jesus said, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can likely speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward now let's see what topic jesus then goes on to preach while these jesus while, uh, while these uh children are still in his presence and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea and if thy hand offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. I mean, he's preaching quite graphic here, isn't he? He's talking about like cutting off hands, cutting off feet. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So you see here the, child, the, ch the children were there, the children were young enough to be carried up 
And then he preaches on the horrors of hell. He goes into a very deep topic, a quite a scary topic that a lot of parents would consider, right? To say, well, why would, why would you want a child listening to hell and the horrors of hell so graphic about cutting off hands? It's because children need to be warned about hell as well. They need to be warned about hell. And they need to know the seriousness of it. And Jesus didn't see any problem with going into this sermon or this sermon here or talking about this topic with children here. Right? So we see here that Jesus, you know, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't censor anything. He didn't hide anything from the children. He preached openly about things that were quite graphic, that were quite dark, that were quite scary, even while children were there, because children need to have this fear of hell instilled in them as well. So when we teach our children the Bible, right, we need to teach our children the whole Bible. From a very young age you know don't hold back in teaching your children the bible like teach them everything uh, as you read through it so show, let me show you here in deuteronomy 6 verses 6 to 7 it says here and these words which i command thee this day shall be in thine heart so i've sort of just highlighted some words there that we're going to go through in a second and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up, right? So this is a command in Deuteronomy, you know, when Moses was giving out the commandments the second time, and he's saying, hey, these words that I commanded you, the law of Moses and the books that he wrote, right? He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he's saying here, hey, you gotta teach them. They gotta be in your heart. You gotta teach them diligently just unto the adults. No, you gotta teach them diligently unto the children right and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up so let's just look at a couple of these so he says here that they shall be in thine heart so obviously teaching the word of god to your children it starts with you right if you don't know the word of god if you don't know why you believe the word of god how are you going to instill that to your children it should just be a natural part of you Right? That you just talk about it, you know it, because you love God, you want to learn the things of God, and it's going to be easy to teach your children the things of God because it's in your heart. Right? So it starts with you. The Word of God has to be in you in order for you to teach it to your children. And he says here, you know, thou shalt teach. Right? Thou shalt teach them diligently. Ephesians 6.4, he says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Right? So this is like this is saying that you are responsible for the teaching, right? It's thou, it's a singular, because you are responsible for making sure your children learn the Bible. You don't just say, Oh, I'm just gonna send them off to Sunday school, send them off to a Christian teacher. I'll just as long as I have them in church every Sunday, they're gonna learn from the preacher every Sunday. No, 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 that's not enough. You know, because if you just if you just count on church, you just count on this one hour a week to teach your children the Bible, that's not sufficient because there's a lot in the Bible, right? And even, I haven't preached on every single topic, every single pas passage, everything that you may know about the Bible. You know a lot more, and you have a lot of opportunities to teach your kids. You have to be proactive, right? And the same with fathers. Fathers, be proactive about teaching your children the Bible. Don't just leave it all up to mum. Be part of it, right? Don't have this mentality that, oh, you know, my, my wife just has that under control. No, you have to know it as well right you have to be involved in the teaching because we don't want to just build this matriarchal society right like in some some black communities it's like that because the men aren't doing anything the women do everything and then the women just start ruling that society because the men have no say they're not doing anything right they're not part of it so that example continues to the next generation because the next men following their fathers are lazy as well not part of you know proactively raising the family teaching the family we don't want to create that sort of culture we need men that are engaged in the education of their family and teaching their children the bible like it says here in ephesians 6 4 it's an exhortation particularly to the fathers to provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the lord so obviously the church is going to support you know you teaching your children right but it's not the primary teacher for your children you are responsible for teaching your children uh, not the church uh, deuteronomy 4 9 only take heed to thyself 
right? The singular, right? And keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. See, if you're not diligent about teaching your children, yeah, you might have learned something when you were in, you know, you were a teenager, you were in youth group, you know, when you were really active in church and you learned it all, but because you're not really as zealous anymore you're not teaching it you know, you've forgotten a lot of those things this is what they're saying here it's like you need to keep thy soul diligently otherwise you're going to forget the things like in this in this instance right they're forgetting the things that they saw in egypt now if they're able to forget the things that they saw in egypt how much more are you likely to forget the things that you learn at church right i mean it's not as exciting as fire falling down from heaven and being swarmed with locusts and toads and i mean that's i don't know how you can forget that stuff right but he's saying here you better take heed to yourself and be diligent about it because you're going to forget even the things you've seen let alone the things that you've heard right uh, unless they depart from my heart all the days of thy life but teach them thy sons right so that's your children and thy son's sons. So what is the Bible talking about here? It's, it's saying, hey, as, as Christians, we ought to be active in the education of the third generation, right? So it's not just the next generation, the generation after that as well. Is that the, sorry, the second generation, not third generation, second generation. So you don't want to just be a grandfather or a grandmother that's just, you know, doesn't know anything about the bio, it's just grandma, she's crazy or whatever. You know, we ought, to be, we ought to be striving to be Christians where the older you are, the more respectable you become, the more knowledgeable you become because you've had more experience, you've been studying the Bible longer so that when you teach your children, when they are parents, you can also help teach their children as well. And that's how we build a solid foundation and a solid community, right? When we know the Bible, we're diligent about it, and we are proactive, not in the next generation, but the, the second generation after that as well. Sittest, walkest, you know, you, we saw that in Deuteronomy where it says you sittest, you know, in thy house, you walk by the way, you liest down, and when you rise up. What is that talking about? That's saying that you should always be teaching your children the Bible at every opportunity you get. So yeah, family devotions are good. If you don't know what a family devotion is, it's kind of like a set time that a family puts aside and they do some, you know, like a mini church at home. I don't have any problem with that at all. If, if families want to do that, but they're, they're, they're not sufficient. Do you know what I mean? Don't, don't get into this mentality that I just tick, tick this checkbox that we just have this event every week and that's, that's fine, it's done. No, you have to know, it has to be a part of you. If you really want to instill the Bible and a love of God into your children, it needs to be a part of you, right? It needs to be just your life. It's, just, it's not just something that, okay, we just, you know, we just turn everything off and then all of a sudden we, we serve God in this two-hour period and we, we think about God and then the rest of the week we just don't think about Him at all. No, no. It needs to be just part of your life, right? When you're sitting down, when you're walking, you're lying, you're rising, you know, from morning till evening, just whenever there's an opportunity. Why? Because, you know, moments happen throughout the day, right? There are things that happen. There's a, there's a, there's a time when a child is curious about something, and that's when they're most attentive. And you want to be able to take that opportunity, right, to teach them when the moment happens. Rather than the moment happening at school, you know, and then you've got them five hours later, somebody else has already taken that opportunity or, you know, so given them the wrong impression or given them the wrong information. They're not asking you anymore. They get home. They don't ask you, is it because they didn't have any questions? No, it's because somebody else already answered them. So this is one main advantage of homeschooling, right? This is, why, this is one of the main reasons why we homeschool. Right? I know there are pros and cons with homeschooling and sending your kid to a school, and everybody's situation is different. So I'm not saying that it's just for everybody, but one of the main advantages of homeschooling is just the fact that you spend more time with your children. And if you're spending more time with your children, guess who's going to influence them more, right? The people that spend time with them. They're the ones that they're learning of. They're the ones that they're getting their answers from and helping them. This is why homeschooling has its advantage if you want to actually instill godliness in a child, right? Because godliness is so easy to rub off, ungodliness, right? So easy to rub off other people and wrong philosophy that it's, it's very, it's very uh, uh, something that we need, need to really be careful of. So obviously the more time you have with your children, the more you're going to influence them. So, you know, you don't want to just think, oh, you know, I've just got this checkbox, I've just, you know, I've done, you know, yeah, they did their Christian worksheet and that, you know, like some schools just have Christian studies. Oh yeah, they did their Christian worksheet, they, they've got Jesus Christ in their life. No, it's, it's not enough. It needs to be part of your life. It's a, worship is a lifestyle, right? 
It's not just an event. It's something you have to understand. It's not that you come to church and this is the time of worship and this is when we focus on God and we think about God. And yes, it helps, right? Where you come one time a week and you, you put everything aside and you come and listen to the Bible, you're encouraged, you're exhorted, you're taught. But that's not how it should be in our life. Everything we do should be done to the glory of God. So whether we eat or drink or whatsoever you, you do, so even the most mundane task you have at work, you ought to be having God on your mind and doing everything to the glory of God, working to the glory of God. Right? And same with teaching our children. Now we ought to teach them diligently, right? So I've already sort of covered some of this, but you know, we need to be proactive. We need to be purposeful, consistent. We need to be thorough. Right? And the way we teach them, we need to know what we believe, why we believe it, be thorough, and we need to convince our children. Right? We, can't just, we can't just have this mentality that our children just you know, will soak it up like a sponge and then just assume that they'll always believe what they believe because one day they're going to start asking questions. Right? So you need to be diligent about how you teach them and give them the answers. And guess what? If you want to do that, who's got to know the answers? You've got to know it. Right? You've got to know, you've got to learn yourself and know why and what you believe so that you can teach your children. You know, I, I watched this TED talk recently about, uh, you know, all the kids, you know, there was this one uh, daughter who left the Westboro Baptist Church. If you don't, you don't remember Westboro. Now, obviously, I do not like Westboro Baptist Church. I don't like what they do. I don't like what they believe. I believe they teach work salvation. They're Calvinists, all that sort of stuff, right? So I'm in no way promoting Westboro Baptist Church. But what I found sad about this talk, basically, uh, one of the Westboro Baptist girls, I think one of the daughters of the, the main, you know, the main woman, when you think of Westboro Baptist, you think of the guy, the preacher, the old guy, that never did really did any, yeah, Fred Phelps did, never really did any media appearances, but most of the, the lady that did all the media appearances was his daughter, right? She was the one that was always on TV and everything. So she had her children, right? But now as the children have grown older, a lot of them have left the church, right? And this, this lady was giving her testimony, basically. And basically what happened with her is she, she was on Twitter, right? And she started tweeting all the stuff that Westboro Baptist does and you know, they do all the picketing and everything like that. And then people started to engage her, right? And she realized she couldn't answer a lot of the objections that they had. So eventually that made her leave the church. And now you hear her talk, she's just like some, it's like she's, almost to thrown out the Bible. She's just like some liberal now where just truth is relative to you and we just need to understand everybody and just like we just all need to get along and you know we just talk then we can understand and there's not really any right. I don't, th that's what the impression I got from this TED talk, right? This, this lady that left the Westboro Baptist Church. But what may, what, 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 the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if you think about that, I mean, I'm pretty sure Westboro Baptist Church homeschooled, right? I'm pretty sure that Westboro Baptist Church was zealous in what they believed, right? They were very zealous to the point where they're picketing, you know, soldiers' funerals and people's funerals and stuff like that. So they were very zealous. They, they, were, they were teaching their children. Their, te their children were so scared, not, not scared, but they, I remember her saying in this talk that she, she didn't want to leave her family because it, like, she didn't want to be ostracized by her family because she loved her family. So there was a lot of love. Right? There was a lot of like, uh, indoctrination. Right? There was a lot of zeal, but if they don't have the why, that's not going to keep them there. Right? Because they need to understand why they believe things and what they believe, because that's actually going to give them a solid foundation. Like the Bible says, that we're ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. We need to understand these things. So if you're not thinking about these things and, hey, why do I believe the things I do? You ought to. If you want to impart that to your children and know that your children are going to grow up with a solid foundation and, and know what they believe and why they believe it. So we want to be proactive, purposeful, consistent, thorough, you know, open and honest with our children. So, this is like, so we can build a relationship with them, right? It's just like with any relationship. You want good communication so that when your children have issues, they have questions, that they're comfortable to come and talk to you about it. But, you know, if you never talk to them about these things, you never talk to them, you're always avoiding it, and they find that somebody else is open to talk to them about it, then they're going to build that relationship with that person rather than with yourself. And then you don't get the opportunity to explain things in light of the truth of the Word of God at those opportunities. So think about this, you know, when if you want to, if you love your children, right? We all love our children. If you truly do want to love them, you need to think about these things so that you can impart um, 
your values and the truth onto them. Joshua 8, 30, 35. This is an interesting passage here. It says here, Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel on Mount Ebal. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron, and they all offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. I believe that's Exodus 20. I think it's at the end of Exodus 20 where it talks about don't build an altar of whole stones. Don't lift your tool upon it. Otherwise you've polluted it. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. So I don't, think they, I don't think they're there just watching him write all five books of the law of Moses. I just think he did it in a public place where everyone knew he was there. He wasn't doing it in hiding. But he actually, on this altar of whole stones, he's actually copying out a law, uh, a copy of the law of Moses. So Genesis to, to Deuteronomy. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well the stranger as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. So remember what we're talking about today. We're talking about the lie of age appropriateness, right? That some parts of the Bible are not appropriate for children and other parts are. Well, look at what happens here. So he's, right, he's written a copy of Genesis to Deuteronomy, right? And then it says here, and afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law. So he reads out now the book of of Mo, the law of Moses to all of Israel. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel. So does it look like Joshua is holding anything back? No, no, he's reading it all. He's not censoring any of it. He's reading it all to the people of God. Look at this. With the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. So you see here that he's reading from Genesis to Deuteronomy, nothing censored, nothing hid. Do you think Joshua felt that there were some things that were not appropriate for children in the Word of God, like Christians do today? No, he didn't think so. You know, Jesus preached about hell. Joshua's reading all the law of Moses. You know, because let's, let's look at some, you know, inappropriate Bible passages where people would say, oh, you know, this is not appropriate for children, where the world thinks, because often it's missing, right, from, from Bible stories and whatnot. And, um, and, and we'll talk about them. So if you're, if you're truly seeking to obey the command of God, to teach your children diligently, there's going to be some topics that you're, you're going to have to cover, right? Because if you're, if you're teaching them the Bible, you're going through the Bible with them, you're talking about the Bible in your house, these topics are going to come up, right? So if they're inappropriate, why, why would God command us to teach the words diligently if there are some things that children just aren't meant to know? right? That's because it's a lie. It's a lie that children aren't meant to know these things. We aren't meant to teach our children. We need to teach our children, right? Teach them while they're young, while they understand, right? So we can get to them first before Satan does. But even if you start reading from the beginning of the Bible, right? You know, the, the topic of sex, obviously, and, and, you know, sexual reproduction and where do babies come from, that's like your stere stereotypical example of like, oh, you know, how do the kids know? You know, they're meant to think that, you know, uh, that, that a crane brings the baby or whatever. And so I never, I never lie to my children. I never tell them about cranes. I never tell them about the tooth fairy. You know, I, I mean, obviously I tell them about it, but I tell them it's a lie. You know, like I never tell my kids that Santa Claus comes and gives them Christian, uh, Christmas presents or the Easter bunny comes or whatever at Easter. You know, I, I never do those things. And it boggles my mind that Christians tell those things to their kids as though it's okay. You know, you know you're lying to your kids. Don't get your kids to put their tooth under the pillow and then sneak money under their pillow and then say, oh, it's funny because the tooth fairy can't. Because they actually believe that. They will actually believe you if you tell them about the tooth fairy. And when they find out you've lied to them, what are they going to think when you tell them about Jesus? When you tell them about God, you tell them about other things that they can't see. They're going to think you're lying about that stuff too, about the Holy Spirit and all that sort of stuff. So you, you want to be careful what you teach your children. You know, you, you might think it's funny, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not good for the, to actually make them believe that it's true, you know, right? Obviously, you know, sometimes you like just trick your kids and then you tell them and you just have a bit of a laugh. 
but I'm saying where, where parents like they were gone years and years, you know, there are kids that are like four or five years old, they still believe in the tooth fairy, still believe Santa Claus brought them presents and whatnot. And that just amazes me that parents will do that to their children. And you wonder why they have trust issues when they grow older. Um, Genesis 4, 1 to 2. So you, I mean, you only get to the fourth chapter. I mean, not even that. We already know that God made Eve in chapter 2. And it says here, the man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. And, and then we get into the, the fall in Genesis 3. And then Genesis 4, it says here, Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So you see, at the very beginning of the Bible, even when you read through Genesis, I mean, you get to, to the flood, right? And you get to all these other things. At the very beginning of the Bible, we have concepts of sex, conception, birth, life, death, nakedness, clothing. You know, they were clothed with sheepskins. You know, the suffering that happens. We, we have family structure, you know, where, you know, the, the woman would say, you know, your desire will be to your husband and he shall rule over you. So these concepts are very early on in Genesis. So, I mean, if we're, if we're not teaching, I mean, we're not reading Genesis, you know, in our, in our families, if we can't talk about these things with children, of course not. So, you know, I have no problem talking to my children about these things, talking to them about, you know, sexual reproductive organs and where babies come from and how it all works. Because once I've explained it to them, I tell them as well, hey, this is something that only mummies and daddies do. This is something that only married people do. You know, it's only right within marriage. And then it instills in them and it grains in them, ah, yes, this is how it works, but it's also the right way is in marriage and the wrong way is outside of marriage and people are doing so. They, un they, they already are being exposed to these things, but being exposed the right way. And then I get a head start on Satan, right? I get a head start because I'm, I'm there. I'm raising them before the world gets to them. So very early on, we see here concepts like this. So, I mean, if, if we're not meant to talk about the birds and the bees with children until they're seven, eight, ten, you know, I don't know now. I mean, back when I was in school, it was quite late. I, I remember learning about it maybe in year six or seven or something like that. And now I know it's getting younger, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but because that's what we're getting onto now, right? Sexual perversion. So remember when Joshua, remember he read all the words of the law before Israel. Hey, those words would have included passages like Leviticus 20, where people think, hey, you know, these aren't suitable for children. These aren't suitable for young, for young years. But let's read it now. Leviticus 20, it says here, And ye shall keep my statutes and do them, I am the Lord which sanctify you. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon, shall be upon him. So we see here some very serious laws here and very serious punishments, capital punishment here. Now, we shouldn't keep these from our children because children ought to know that these are very serious crimes that are being done in this, in this passage. One of them is to curse your father and mother. And the man that committeth adultery, with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So God does not take sexual perversion and sexual fornica you know, fornication lightly. It's a very serious sin because it destroys societies. It destroys families. It causes a lot of uncleanness. You know, it causes, you know, uh, children that are raised without mother and father. You know, orphans and abortions. It's, it's, a, it's a really big problem. And this is, why, this is why these are sins. If a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind, so this is homosexuality. This is why we're against same-sex marriage. Yeah, I get that there are law effects and there are effects on, you know, uh, you know, freedom of religion and freedom of speech and all that sort of thing. But ultimately it comes down because homosexuality is wrong. It's a sin. That's why same-sex marriage is wrong, right? As he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So we see here, it's a package here. There's all this sexual perversion going on. It destroys society. This is why God's outlawing it all. It's not just homosexuality that we're against, that the media tries to portray it that way. It's, it's all fornication. We're against fornication as well. We're against adultery. We're against people sleeping with animals. We're against people having multiple wives. We're against people sleeping with the same gender because marriage and sex is only for a husband and wife. You know, it's about creating children and creating stability within that relationship. 
And if a man shall take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. So you see, even from an early age, children should be disgusted at these things, right? You should be teaching them, hey, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is, this is, a, this is a grave sin in God's eyes to the point where God puts the death, pen, death penalty on these activities. That's the sort of mindset I want to instill into my children that, hey, I want you to be disgusted at these things, right? I want you to, to know that these things are wrong because this is what God thinks of them rather than, you know, they go to school, right? And they learn that it's just all normal. This is another way of life. You know, that's one reason why I grew up really hating cigarettes, really hate, really hating smoking. It was just something that my dad instilled in me because every time we would walk by somebody that smoked, I, I just remember without fail, he would comment about it. He'd just say, it's gross, it's disgusting. You know, they're, they're breathing in smoke and you know, their hands are all yellow, their breath stinks and everything. So I, I, never, I never even, like even though I knew kids in high school smoking cigarettes, I, I, di I didn't want to touch them because just, just, just the fear and, and the disgusting, like, you know, I guess gut reaction that my father had instilled with me. I always hated cigarettes. I always hated the smell and because just of what, uh, of what he had always commented to me every time I was just walking with him, right? And he'd see somebody smoke, or we'd be standing in line, somebody would be smoking. He would always comment. And that's what I want my children to think of, you know, when, when they think of things that are, are wrong and disgusting and evil, you know, I want them to have that first reaction, and then I get a bit of a head start, like I said, on the world and teaching them the things of the Bible. Uh, if a woman approach unto any beast, so these are people that sleep with animals, this is so disgusting, and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. So we see here that when Joshua read the word of God to the nation of Israel, I mean, he didn't hold anything back, right? He, had, he read from the law of Moses. It would have included Leviticus. You know, a, a book that many people have no idea what is in there because they've never heard it preached in church before. They've just never heard these things. There are, there are some passages that I preach on and people are just like, I've never ever heard of that passage before. Yeah, it's because it never gets preached on. Never, it never gets talked about. But you have topics of capital punishment, adultery, homosexuality, right, fornication, bestiality, things like that that children ought to be aware of Right? You don't have to go into all the nitty-gritty details. The Bible doesn't do that. But it exposes them. To it. it tells them about it, gives them the right mindset, and tells them what God thinks about it. And that's what we want them to know. We want them to be aware of very early on so that we can set that behavior in them. And then as they start to learn more, we start explaining the why and the details, right? And then talk about them as they, you know, as they progress. I'm not saying that you're just going to unload on a, on a three-year-old. Right? They're not gonna, you're not even going to hold their attention. Now, just a point I have about safe schools, right? Because, you know, with the whole same-sex marriage debate and same-sex marriage and, and, you know, marriage and all that sort of stuff, right? A lot of, what I found in the public debate is that there was a lot of, there was a lot of Christian people, right? I don't know whether they're saved or not because obviously a lot of Orthodox and a lot of Catholics and, you know, just Christ, going by the name Christian, right? So I, I don't know all, all what they believe and I'm not saying that they, um, they believe what we believe by any stretch of the imagination, but... One thing that they, you heard again and again on the news, right? Because, you know, one of the, the, the Coalition for Marriage and, and they had all these mums talking about the Safe Schools Program. Right? The Safe Schools Program was a program that was, you know, instituted in, uh, I think, in, a Mel in Melbourne schools and Ros Ward, who, who was the, the head of that, she's like a lesbian and she, you know, wants to destroy the family and you can read up about all her philosophies and whatnot. But... And obviously, I'm against the Safe Schools program because it teaches sexual perversion and sexual promiscuity and transgender theory and all this weird stuff that is, you know, just against Bible doctrine. But a lot of people, a lot of the parents that I saw on YouTube and whatnot, are just commenting like, oh, I don't want my children exposed to, that know that boys have a penis and girls have a vagina and know about all these things. And, and it's just like, well, this is this mentality that I'm talking about, this mentality that, that parents think that there are things that are appropriate for adults that aren't appropriate for children, and they just don't want their children to be taught about these things at all. Now, this is what I think is not biblical. It's a lie, right? Because children should know about these things. They should know the difference between a female 
and a male. They should know the, where babies come from. They should know uh, how children are created and how uh, they're conceived in the womb and where they come from and all that sort of stuff. So you have all these parents just freaking out about you know, sex and reproductive organs being exposed to their children because they don't think children should be learning this at all. That's not the problem I have with the Safe Schools program. I don't have a problem with the Safe... I don't have a problem with children learning about these topics as long as they're learning about it the right way. Right? They're learning about it in the right philosophy. They have the right mindset to know, hey, these are, this is how it happens, but it's between man and wife. It's in marriage, and that's how God intended it. That's right. Fornication is wrong. But that's not what the Safe Schools program is teaching. The Safe Schools program is teaching that children ought to experiment sexually and experiment with risky sexual practices. And, you know, they should have multiple partners and do all these and just experiment. They should sow their wild oats so that they can just experience these things because it's just a natural way of growing up. That's what's wrong. That's what's sin. That's fornication. That's what God is outlawing, and that's what he has laws against because those things are what are destroying a society. And if we allow same-sex marriage, this is, this is the problem that it's going to have. It's just going to make that snowball keep going. So the problem is not the topics, right? It's the philosophy because children should know about these things, but it's just this whole gender fluidity and transgenderism. My wife was listening to a video just before church today about this woman I don't know who it was, but she was going on about all the different letters in these acronyms. And it's just getting longer and longer and longer, right? It used to be LGB, now it's LGBT, now it's LGBTIQPAA, something. I don't, and, and she was going through what all these different... And, and it's not like just... You think you, they go through these letter lists and you think they're making fun of it? But then, they, no, these actually all stand for something. And it's just crazy. Like P is like pansexual. I don't even know what that is. And then you have intersex, and that's like, you know, that's not somebody who, who's like transgender. Like transgender is like a male who thinks he's a female and a female thinks he's a male. Transgender is like, I think you could just go between them. Like, you know, like when you're younger, you're a girl, and then you just transition into a male when you're older, and then you transition back to it. And then you have like uh, uh, inter, inter, intersex, and then you have uh, um, Q is like queer or questioning, they say. Q is just que question, questioning. It's like, you don't know whether you're a male or a female. So you're just neither. You're just like, you're just wondering. That, that, that's its own letter in, the, in their acronym. And they have one that's like polysexual. So polysexual is basically just open fornication. It's just po either polygamy or poly. You know, you, you, you hear like polyamory. It's just where they, they're basically just normalizing just having sex with anybody, you know? And, and, and we're meant to think that's okay, right? They, they think that that's just normal. That's just another sexual identity. No, that's the problem with the Safe Schools program. It's, it's the philosophy behind it. And it's just this idea that fornication is okay, whereas the Bible says it's a sin. <clears throat> Let's go on. So another one. I've just got a few examples here. Just to give you a couple of examples and then we'll end. But one is like animals are food. You know, like, like something I see amongst children is they get, like a lot of children, they get freaked out when they realize animals are slaughtered in order for us to eat, right? They eat their sausages, they eat their steak, they're all happy. And then they go to a farm or they, and they watch a video on YouTube, they see some chickens getting slaughtered and they're just like, no, because like, you know, this chicken's a fluffy thing in their cartoons all the time. And it has a personality and it's like, how can you kill this thing to eat it? Well, that's the problem because if that's the only thing you expose your children to, if all they know about chickens is like chicken little or whatever, and it's just like, they're just this funny character and it's like, you know, like Finding Nemo, and after they watch Finding Nemo, they don't want to eat fish anymore because, you know, that's all they think about fish. That's the problem, right? Because you're not, you're not reading them Genesis 9-3 where it says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So you show them a video of a slaughterhouse and say, Hey, this is how we get our chicken. In Coles, you know, the chicken is there. You show them a video when you're homeschooling them and you say, hey, this is how chickens are slaughtered and prepared. This is how we get their food. So their first impression is not that they're like a human, that they're an animal, right? They're an animal that's created for us, right? And we can eat them. And then they watch Chicken Little or they watch Finding Nemo and then you can tell them they're just giving the animals personality, but the animals don't have that personality. And they already know, right? So then they just know this is just make-believe, right? It's just, it's just a fantasy, right? It's not real. So you teach them from a young age, right? And then they're not going to get freaked out 
you know, when they see animals getting slaughtered, when they see blood, you know, it's just these, these, these kids that are just so, they need to go to their safe space because, you know, it's just hurting them too much. No, no, you, you, you build some resilience in them. If you expose them to these things and you talk to them about it, then they're not freaked out about it. I remember watching this video on YouTube where these, these people, they went to a slaughterhouse for the first time and then, you know, they've been eating chicken their whole life, you know, KFC, Chicken McNuggets, whatever, right? And they go to this slaughterhouse and they had to slaughter their own chicken. And, and, and even you can tell that there's like an agenda in the people that did that documentary because they're just making it so dramatic and it's like the chicken's dying and it's just like the music's playing and they're just like the violin, you know, it's just like, and then the people are just like, oh, I don't want to eat chicken anymore because it's just like, it's so distraught. Yeah, well, maybe if they had learned about it as a kid, right? Like somebody that grows up on a farm, you know, they've seen their chickens with their head cut off. It was, I think my wife was telling me about it. Like they used to cut the heads of the chicken and they wouldn't do it properly. And the chicken would be running around. Like that's, you know, that's, uh, they're exposed to it. Like children find that funny, right? They don't find it really that distressing or anything. It's when you hide it from them is when it's distressing. All right, I won't read all these passages. I'll just sort of focus on what I've underlined just because sake, for sake of time, because always go longer than I think, but look, these are some, this is other sort of inappropriate topics, right? That people say, oh, these are inappropriate for children. And when they learn Bible stories, they never learn, like it's so, it's so frustrating getting children's books with Bible stories because they never give the whole story, right? Well, one of them is with Noah's Ark. You know, Noah's Ark is, is one that is notorious for being like inaccurate with the, with the measurements of the ark, you know, that's what Answers in Genesis is all about. They build these arcs because they want to show children how big these arcs really are. And that if you were to fit two of every kind on the ark, plenty of space on the ark. But you see children's cartoons of arcs, it's all crowded on there. You know, the, the giraffe's heads are sticking out of the ark and it's just so small. It's, it's still sunny, you know, the, the water's like all calm. And, you know, and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, the story just becomes about Noah just like catching these animals and he's like trying, and, which is not even true, you know, so the size of the ark's not true, Noah didn't have to go out and catch all the animals, some of the animals he took seven on, I don't know if you know that, like there's some of them he took seven on, not just two, God brought them to the ark, the ark was huge, the ark only had one window, a lot of arks have multiple windows, and, and not only that, but the point of the ark was to save them from God's judgment, right? Where, you know, we even have this Noah's Ark song on one of our iPads at home and it's all like dun 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 and he's collecting all the animals and everything, talk about Noah. And even, it's just funny because it's, it's still that tune even when the flood is like happening and you're just thinking like that's not a happy moment. That's like, you know, people are being judged and everyone just got, got wiped out by God because God was so angry with people's sin. You know, this is what people have to know about Noah's Ark, right? And when they look at the rainbow, it's not just, oh, look at the beautiful rainbow that God created. No, it's like, hey, that rainbow reminds us that one before God killed the whole earth because that's what God thinks about sin. That's what he thinks about things that are wicked. And we ought to not just take the judgment of God that lightly. What's another one? David and Goliath, right? David and Goliath. When we read through the story in 1 Samuel 17, I'll just read through this a bit. So David put his hand in his bag. So remember, this is already when he's got, got the five smooth stones. He's about to go and, and fight, David, uh, fight Goliath. So David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it, smote the Philistine in the forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Right? So it, was, so it was a headshot, right? It wasn't just he threw the stone and the stone just put a bump on his head you know, you see David and Goliath cartoons and then Goliath's on the floor and he's, on, like, he's got the stars around him and he just knocked him out. This, this is not what happened when David fought Goliath. This was a battle. The stone sunk into his forehead. It killed Goliath. So David prevailed over against the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran. So this is the part you never learn about with David and Goliath. So David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. So after David actually threw the stone and, and killed Goliath in the forehead, he actually went over, took his sword and cut off his head. Right? So this is part of the story that children don't learn about. Right? And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron and, and, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even to Gath and unto Ekron. 
And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. Look at this. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. So he didn't just cut it off and leave it there. He actually cut it off and took it with him. But he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host. So anyways, it goes on and he basically brings the head of the Philistine to Saul, right? To prove that he had died and whatnot. The last one I've got here is Elijah on Mount Carmel. So we all know this great victory. If you know about the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, where he basically calls the prophets of Baal up until the mountain, and then they, they, both, they both slaughter the bullock, and then God answers you know, Elijah by fire. But I don't know if you knew this about the story, right? So it says here, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench, right? So this is after Elijah has prepared his sacrifice, right? And he says, the, the God that answers by fire, he is the true God. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. And the Lord, he is the God. And that's usually where it stops, right? But that's not where the story stops in the Bible. It says, Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Right? So it wasn't that, hey, we just had this face-off with these false prophets and we won and it's all good. No, no, no. We, we won against the false prophets. Now let's take the false prophets and let's put them to death because this is what God thinks about false prophets. So you may read through these stories and you may think, oh, hey, these, these aren't appropriate. What's that doing in the Bible? These aren't appropriate for children. Well, that just shows that you've been brainwashed by the world <laughs> that, that these are not appropriate for children when the Bible says they are appropriate for children, right? They, are, they, they ought to be taught to our children so that children learn about why. Why should they be taught to our children? So children understand that God is not just a God of flowers and fluffy bunnies, right? He's not just a God of love. He's a God of wrath as well. He's a holy God that hates sin. And we have these examples in here, right? Where God judged the world because they, were, they, they had gotten so sinful, he just wanted to start over again. And then we have a, the example of the Philistine. It's like, hey, these are God's enemies, right? This is how God is going to treat his enemies, so we better be on the Lord's side and not on the enemy of God's side. And we see here what God thinks of false prophets. So it's not just, ah, oh, you know, the friendly imam down the street. No, 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 God hates that. He hates the fact that there are people teaching another Jesus and Muslims have another Jesus, right? Because the Jesus, that's not the son of God. He's just a prophet. You know, we have a lot of false religions and we ought to have the right perspective on people just teaching false religion. This is what God thinks of false prophets and people teaching another way to heaven. Why? Because if people believe another way to heaven, they're going to go to hell, right? So that's why it's a big deal. Because if they teach another Jesus, they teach another way to hell, uh, sorry, another way to heaven, they're sending people to hell. That's a big deal right and another thing is you know god like i said god is not just this fluffy god it just he's just love and bunnies and roses right he's a god of wrath as well so when we read these stories in the bible we think whoa this is pretty serious hey these what happened to goliath is nothing to what's happening to people in hell right when they're tormented you know god is a god of wrath right and we ought not you know people mock god and they laugh at him they scoff him they're not going to be scoffing God in hell, right? That's why they ought to believe. They need to believe on Jesus Christ because if you don't accept the grace of God, you will be in the presence of God with your sin. And, you know, this is why, this is why people grow up. They grow up. And how many, people, how many times have you heard somebody say this? But God, why would a loving God create hell? Right? They say things like that because all throughout their childhood and all through church, they've never heard these stories. They've all just, God is just love, love, love. And I, don't get me wrong, God is love, right? But the, a loving God also hates, right? He hates sin and he has judgment as well because he's holy, right? Because he loves righteousness, he's going to hate sin. And this is why hell exists because God hates sin that much that hell is an eternal torment of fire and you know, children that don't understand, they don't get the full picture of God, they do not comprehend why hell exists, right? Because they just think God is just love and he just loves everybody and it doesn't matter how you live, it's all fine. No, that's not the God of the Bible. And this is what we have to teach our children, that this is not how God is. God is somebody to be respected, 
to be feared and to be obeyed, not just somebody that we just you know, toss aside. We just, we just go to him when we want something, right? Like, I mean, this is one thing we really have to grasp as Christians. It's like when, when we pray, you know, you often hear it a lot, but we need to be reminded. It's like, do you realize who you're praying to? Do you realize that the God, the God you're praying to is the God of the universe that created the world? He's more glorious than anything you can ever imagine. And yet we just treat him like Father Christmas, right? Easter Bunny. Just, hey, hey, God, I need something. Yeah, it's, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't care about church. I don't care about soul winning. I don't care about the things of you. But, hey, I need something now. God, answer my prayer. I mean, that, you know, obviously that sort of mentality, you know, that, that sort of attitude is, is very disrespectful towards God, you know? And it's like, who do we think we're talking to? We're talking to the God of the universe. That's why we ought to take the things of God seriously. And we ought to, you know, uh, give him the reverence that he deserves, even though he's a God of mercy and grace as well. You know, he's a, he's a God of love. He's a God of mercy and grace. So don't think you can't go to God, you know, but we need to just understand who God is and comprehend that he's, he's somebody to be feared. You know, Leviathan is, is, is a... Is a, is a very scary creature in Job 41, right? It talks about, you know, uh, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down. So a lot of people, a lot of people believe that Leviathan is actually a, a fire-breathing dragon. And I, that's what I believe, right? Because that's what the Bible describes him as. You know, he lives in the sea and whatnot. So, you know, these myths and legends about dragons and breathing out fire, uh, you know, these, these are not just myths and legends, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, like unicorns, for example, are in the Bible. You know, it's, it's not so crazy for a horse to have a horn on its head. But I definitely believe in dragons. I don't think they're just mythological. I think they actually exist. You know, I don't know uh, whether they still exist. Maybe they've been hunted to extinction. You know, maybe what we think of dinosaurs, you know, when we think of dinosaurs, they were actually dragons, you know, and things like that. But, um, you know, you just got to think about this. Ken Hovind does a really good talk on dragons and whatnot. But uh, one thing that, that really struck me is like, you know, the Chinese zodiac. You know, the zodiac has like 11 animals that are real animals. And then all of a sudden there's a dragon on there. It's like, why, why is there like one mythological creature and the rest are just normal creatures? Well, it's maybe because the dragon is an actual real creature. Anyway, so this is the Le Leviathan. Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? So it's like, is Leviathan going to come to you and speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Will thou play with him as a, with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the, amongst the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Leviathan, look what God says here. Who then is able to stand before me? Oh, you know, he's, say, he's saying like, hey, there's this creature that exists that breathes fire that people are so scared of. Just looking at him makes you tremble. You know, so there's only, you know, not even brave people tremble when they fight him. And he says here, hey, there's, there's none so fierce that dare stare him. They don't even dare to stir up Leviathan, right? And he says, hey, who is then going to even stand before me, right? Before God, because God is to be feared even more than this creature that is terrible and, and, and ferocious. So, you know, you might have this mentality, you know, hopefully this sermon has sort of like changed your perspective where you say, hey, I'll teach it to them when they're older, when they're older, right? But, you know, older could be too late, right? And we think about the story of Moses, right? It says here, the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Now, if you remember Moses' story, right? Moses, when he was young, they were going to kill him, and then, you know, they, they hid him, and then he went into the, the Ark of Bulrushes, and then Pharaoh's daughter found him, he cried, had compassion on him, and then because of that, she took him as his own child. But, you know, she, couldn't, she, she had somebody nurse the child, so the mother nursed the child, right? Because uh, uh, Moses' sister said, hey, I'm gonna, I'll find a Hebrew woman for you to nurse the child. So he was actually nursed and raised by his mother. Now, we don't know how old he was when he went to be Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh's daughter's son. But well, I guess we can only surmise that he was very young, right? So we don't know how long Moses' mom had with Moses before she had to hand him off to somebody else. Now, do you think she waited till he was older to teach him the ways of God, to teach him the laws of God, to teach him who he truly was, what his, what his, where his origins were, who he was, that he was a Hebrew and all that sort of thing? No, of course not, you know? 
And how much, how much time did you think she had? She would have taken every chance she had to teach him the things of God, to instill those values, right? And you got to ask, you know, how long do you have with your children before it's too late? You know, what if, they, what if one day they're taken away from us? What if same-sex marriage is legalized and now it's abuse for you to discipline your children, to teach them right from wrong, to teach them gender, male and female, and your children are taken away from you and you never taught them about these things? You know, aren't you going to regret it? Aren't you going to be, oh, I should have taught them when I had the chance rather than thinking they had to be 10 years old. You know, they were taken away when they were seven, when they were eight. I won't read that, but you know, Moses, he goes on, we know, to do great things for God. Uh, even though he had so little time. Um, I'll just end here. You know, it says here, Proverbs 19, 18, Chasten thy son while there is hope. So you see, even with discipline, there is a time when it's too late to teach your children, right? Because so, you need to discipline them young. Even when you didn't, you didn't discipline them when they're young, it's a lot harder when they're a bit older, right? Like, I discipline my children really young. That's why you can see that they're generally in control, right? And they listen to me, and guess what? They fear me, because they ought to fear me, right? Because they ought to fear punishment from their father for doing wrong. And that's why you get a reaction. Sometimes they do it because they love you. Sometimes they do it because they fear you, right? But it's, it should be both. They should fear and respect and love you. But it says here, chasten thy son while there is hope. That means that there is a time when there's no longer hope, right? That chastening doesn't do anything anymore. And it's going to be the same that, you know, you teach them young while you have hope because there might be a time you know, especially if they've been raised in the public school and they have friends, but they're not listening to you anymore and you've lost your chance. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. Some closing thoughts. You know, the haters of God, you know, there's the sodomites out there, the homosexual agenda. Hey, they're not scared of teaching your kids. They're pushing through government to put safe schools in, teach their philosophy. They're not holding back. Why should we hold back? Do you know what I mean? Like, why should we hold back in teaching our children the truth when the world is out there trying to teach our children the truth? Well, the, teach the children their lies, right? Their, what they would deem as truth. So they're not holding back. You know, they don't reproduce. They have to recruit, right? Because they're not having children. They have to try to get these laws passed for surrogacy and IVF and all this perverted stuff in order to get children, get other people's children, trying to adopt other people's children. They're not scared to teach their children these things. They create media, don't they? They create songs. They're all the ones creating the songs and the movies and the cartoons and the video games. This is what sucks about being Christian sometimes because it's like your kids don't get any of that cool stuff, right? The, the video game, because there's, the there's nobody out there making decent Christian stuff that's actually good and biblically accurate. You know, that's why, you know, not every Christian needs to go to Bible college and be a preacher and be a bishop. You know, sometimes you just got to use your skills. You know, if you're a graphic artist or you can do program stuff or you're good at doing things or resourcing and building stuff or making stuff. Hey, why don't you use, use those resources? Make some things for the children of God. Make some things for the parents of God. This is why I make things. I put it on the website because I want parents to be able to use them. Hey, you can do that too. If you have a skill, make some things to help parents teach their children, right? That's what they're doing. They're creating the songs. You know, if you have musical talent, instead of complaining, oh, you know, we don't use musical instruments in church, which we don't, why don't you use that musical talent to make some soundtracks, make some children's songs, write some music, so that, hey, Christian families have some godly music that they can listen to that's actually biblically accurate, that they don't mind their children listening to, that they, they, can, they can use as a soundtrack to their family album, right? And it's great. Like, this stuff is great. You know, I'd love to have all this stuff. Um, cartoons, video games, school programs. They're all designed to teach your children. So you better make sure you get to your children before they do, right? I talked about that. You know, you want a head start on Satan. So make sure you're teaching them young. Obviously, you've got to reduce it to the complexity that they can understand. But don't buy into the lie of age appropriateness that you just put off teaching them the whole counsel of God because you just think it's not age appropriate, right? I hope today I've showed you that there's, there's no such thing in the Bible. Um, if it's wrong for adults, obviously if it's wrong for children, it's wrong for you as well, right? If it's right for children, it's right for you as well. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. 
Um, pray, Lord, that you would help us as parents, and a lot of parents in this uh, auditorium, to be reminded. And uh, Lord, help us not to buy into the world's lies that you know, we can't teach our children the whole counsel of God. So I pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom. It requires wisdom, Lord, to teach our children. Lord, help us to have patience. Help us to, to have the love that you have for us. And I just pray, Lord, that we, would you give us wisdom, that we know what to say, when to say, how to say it, so that we can instill in them, Lord, uh, the, the, the things that are right and true. We thank you and we, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.